In this tutorial we're going to be getting to grips with Nuke Studio and we're going to be following the conforming process of an edit. Um, in this particular case um, I've got Premiere open and I've just got this little short seven shot sequence in here and it, it combines a, a couple of different things like a potential visual effects shot there something there where we could maybe flip that around and maybe a little bit of color correction so it is going to enable us to uh, to exploit the uh, the scope of Nuke Studio. Um, these files are low resolution quick times that have been done I think they're uh, something like 720 by 405 so they are in 169 aspect ratio but they're in some low resolution format and it's not unusual for an editing department when they're working in the offline phase to be working with low resolution versions of the masters and that's kind of the workflow that I'm trying to show here even though I'm, I'm not working with massive files uh, I'm uh, it, and I just want to get this process across. So the editing department would be working on this. They would um, they would get to the point where their edit would be signed off by the director and production team, and that would be known as picture lock. At that point, the edit can be transformed to the conforming phase of the project. Now, this tutorial essentially is going to follow that process. Now, the edit is transferred via a proprietary file format called the Edit Decision List, or EDL, and there's a or should I say it's a file um, and it's a convention there are two or three different file formats that can be used for it but essentially they're the same they're a text-based representation of the edit and they refer to the name of each piece of footage all the cuts their position on the timeline any speed changes any transitions etc are all in encapsulated into this text file okay so we're in uh, we're, we're in Premiere and exporting uh, an EDL is very simple uh, if we come to the export, I will need to make sure that the timeline is selected. We come down to the export. This is going to slip off your off the bottom of your screen, um, unfortunately. But if you do this, you'll see that there's an EDL option and there's a couple of other options: AAF and Final Cut Pro XML. So there are three formats. Uh, I'm just going to choose the AAF one. I don't recommend the EDL. Um, it ten it's an old format, it tends not to be that reliable, particularly dealing with speed changes, transitions, and it only allows you to export one track at a time. Now you can see in this case we are actually only working with one track, so it doesn't really matter, but if we were working with an edit that had been made up over two or three or more tracks, then we would have to export an EDL for every single one of those tracks, and it can be a bit tedious. Anyway, I'm just going to take this in its in its default setting and say OK, and it's going to ask me where I want to save this. And in the root folder, I've created an EDL folder and I'm actually going to save it into you can see I've already done it so I will just give it an, an additional name I'll just uh, I'll just append it by a number and say OK and that has created an EDL file so if I just bring my folder structure in there and we're going to the EDL you can see that that uh, uh, where is it I think, yeah, there it is, look, 0, 1. So that's the AFL. You can see there's also an XML one in there, which is another form of an edit decision list. And then there's the standard EDL one. So I've actually been exporting these out. Anyway, we progress. So I'll close Premiere down, and we can now start to work in the Nuke Studio. So this is a, a Nuke Studio file that, that's opened. And I'm going to come in. This was formerly Hero. Hero. Uh, I'm going to come into this and um, I'm going to create a new project. I've actually created one accidentally there. But anyway. So what I'm, the first step I'm going to do is I'm going to import my EDL. So I'm going to come to File. I'm going to come down to Import. Unfortunately, this is... Um, I'm going to be uh, confined by the screen capture software here, so it's going to be quite tricky. But you can see there that's the EDL XML AF format. I'm going to choose that, and now it requires me to navigate to my to my folder. I can actually set this up uh, to, to to go to the default, which I'll, I'll probably do bef uh, before we progress much more. So I'm going to come into my project, into the EDLs, and this is the EDL that I've just created. Okay, now you can see that straight away it's actually brought in the edit, it's conformed the edit. Hopefully that's exactly the same as the original, we'll check that in a bit. Um, and it's even brought in the images. Now it doesn't always do that, if it doesn't bring in the images then I will quickly show you what to do. 
Um, in fact, it's, it's brought in the images, but it's brought them in at the wrong. It's brought in the masters rather than the um, rather than the proxies. And I want to actually show that process. So I'm actually going to I'm actually going to take the video offline just by deleting that out. So you can see now that the timeline's changed. All the clips are offline. Uh, and I'm doing that really just to show you how to bring the video in if it doesn't automatically come in with the ex with the EDL. So I'm going to change my workspace over to the conforming workspace. Uh, again, I'm just going to have to quickly pop that back into my screen capture area. Unfortunately, when I switch workspaces, that's likely to keep happening. Unfortunately, I do apologize for that. Okay, we can see the difference with the conforming workspaces that we see eff effectively. We see our EDL. We see all the, all the clips brought in there with all their relevant metadata. Okay, we can still see that our edits here. Now, to bring in our, our media, we just come to Match Media, and then we navigate to our. I will definitely sort this out. Uh, we navigate to our our project, and into our plate, and here's our proxies, and we'll say Open. Uh, this gives us some rules about about how we actually sort of conform. Uh, we'll leave those as default for now. We can include and exclude particular patterns of of of, uh, of suffixes. But I'm just going to say OK, and you can see now that this has actually brought this in. And you can see now that these files are 720 by 405. Now we are actually going to conform these by upresing these back to the nat back to the HD ones. But typically, our project may well come in like this. So it may well come in at this kind of format. With the I'm just looking down this list to see if that 720405 format's in, which it isn't. So if I was work, if I needed to work for a while in that format before actually upresing, then I can choose custom, which is just off the screen capture, and I can set it up in here. So I'm just going to double check that I haven't already created a proxy. No, I haven't. So I'll just create myself a proxy format and I will tell it to be 720 by 405 and we can now use that format and you can see the edit in place there drawing on the low resolution proxy versions of the edit which would have been used in the offline phase in Premiere. So the next stage of the conforming process would be to upres up this back to the master back to the masters. Uh, this would normally be a stage where we w went up to uh, the highest possible resolution, the highest res ice scans of our uh, of our plate footage. In this particular case we've just kind of done it in reverse so we're, we're just going to do that again. So I'm just going to select my footage and, uh, and press delete and delete that out which takes all the clips offline. And then in the conform workspace just choose match media and this time I'm just going to go to my master a master footage and choose open and they will come in now you can see that these are the 1920 by 1080 s so I just need to put my workspace back over to the full HD format which is there okay so that is the process of up -resing. one thing that this process does show is how important it is to maintain good folder and file uh, management because uh, because essentially the proxy footage and the masters are named identically and they've got exactly the same folder structure we could up res uh, if if they were different but it would be a beast of a job whereas because they're named the same then everything just swaps out so these clip references these containers are now just they're now just holding the high resolution version of the same thing they haven't had to sort of st start to redefine their paths and the file names and the file extensions etc so this is a real it's really important that you maintain good file and folder disciplines when you're actually following these kind of processes now one thing that isn't particularly very intuitive or user friendly is the naming conventions that have been applied to these clips we just stretch this out a little bit you can see that these clips are basically taking their their name from the metadata that's generated by the camera during the acquisition process um, which um, each camera has their own rhymes and reasons for generating this but that's obviously transferred into the image sequence and therefore that's actually what's been brought in now in terms of editing it's not very helpful to us to have that kind of uh, that kind of naming convention so we want to be able to find a way of doing this now it's actually quite straightforward uh, I'm just going to marquee select all my clips. I could have done it in the conform workspace as well. I'm just going to flip over to the editorial 
workspace unfortunately again that flips me back to my full screen so I do apologize this is a limitation of the screen capture software um, or an incomp incompatibility should I say between uh, Nuke Studio and my screen capture software so I'm just going to come down to my edit make sure all of my clips are selected so marquee select them all now I'm going to right click I'm going to come to editorial which again I apologize is just off the screen and I'm going to, going to come down to rename shots and that brings up this rename shot dialog and this is really helpful uh, by default it would probably look like this Uh, so it would basically be appending the name of the of the shot by four digit number um, and that's obviously making provision for a, a, a sequence which would literally have hundreds of clips um, in our case we are only we've only got seven clips so we don't need uh, we, we could effectively do this just with one with one um, with one digit but we'll, we'll, we'll use two um, we can also tell it what frame and what uh, number to start so at the moment it's set to 10 for, for example with some uh, editing workflows they start their they start their number in at 1001 in our case we'll just set that to one and then the next thing is how many we increment our numbers by this is set to increment by 10 which means we would get 1 11 21 31 etc uh, I'm going to leave this at one so that we get a shot one two three four five six etc uh, but it would be useful to increment for example if we were creating interim iterations between and we want to basically to leave ourselves a little bit of space to be able to put extra clips in but after picture lock that should be unlikely okay so I'm gonna hit the rename now and you can see now that all our clips along the timeline have been renamed and if I dare go into the conform workspace and cause the havoc in my screen capture area then all the clips in the metadata section of the conforming workspace would also be renamed you can see that the actual clip references themselves are still referencing the names in the in the folder in the operating system where the names obviously haven't changed this is just purely and simply the, the renaming of the containers something I should point out about the renaming process is that we've just used the sequential renaming but we can use some of the other options in here just to rename individual clips etc um, but uh, you know there's uh, and there are some benefits to doing that but uh, but in, in my particular case I wanted to use the sequential renaming because it's uh, by far the mo most useful tool amongst that set okay so let's move on now the next part of the conforming workflow is to check the conformed edit for accuracy against the original so normally the the offline team would have provided us with a low resolution proxy of the sequence uh, which I have which I'm just going to get it's in my exports folder of the my exports folder of the of the project so I'm and I've just got this proxy in so I'm just going to drag that into my project and then I'm going to take this and I'm going to drag it down onto my timeline and I'll just dock it at the at the front okay so what we want to do now is we want to be able to check our original against and one of the one of the first things we'll be looking for is to make sure they're the same length and you can see there that thankfully they are I happen to know that the proxy is, is identical to the uh, to, to the e, to the what the EDL so I'm just going to offset it a little bit just so that I can give you a proof of concept what we need to be able to do is we need we need to be able to do a like for like check against these two and, it, and we can actually do this in new studio because Nuke Studio allows us to put two tracks of video onto the buffer so to do this I'm just going to choose my my, con my conformed edit and I'm just going to type 1 to set that to w the one side of the buffer and I'm going to choose my uh, my proxy and type number 2 you can see we get this little widget appear here um, and what we've got here if I just expand this a little bit is we've got a few little tools here and this is very similar to in Nuke which allows us to allow us to do like that like for like consider con uh, comparisons so I'm just going to say for example switch to horizontal and now we can see both tracks side by side now the reason why we're not seeing the uh, the proxy which I've put into track 2 so it's over here is because uh, we're currently over here but you see that as I come across because I've offset the clip then obviously it doesn't start at the beginning and what this allows us to do is it allows us to check 
to see if there are any timing issues. Um, obviously, I've I've nudged the entire sequence over, so there's a misalignment, um, and this might be misalignment on a shot by shot basis. So this requires quite a lot of scrutiny, even on a on a short seven seven shot sequence like this. If there were problems, for example, if the EDL hadn't hadn't conformed the um, um, any time changes that have been done inside the edit, you know, like speed ups or things like that, or some of the transitions haven't come across qu uh, quite correctly, then it, it may it may take uh, you know it may take 30 minutes just to go through a short sequence like this, just to make sure everything's bang on. You've got to bear in mind that the edit has been signed off by the production team and the director, uh, therefore you are completely committed to that edit, so you can't be you can't sort of. Um, you can't be loose with it at all. You've got to be absolutely bang on. So in this particular case, we could use a variety of different things to uh, to, to realign it. So we could use retiming tools inside the editorial suite in um, in 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 Nuke Studio, or we could use transforms, for example, if something needed to be just positioned, repositioned, or rescaled slightly. Um, and and so on and so forth. In this particular case, we know that these align perfectly. So if I just bring that over, then we can check now, and we can see that they're identical. The other option, there are a few options here, but this wipe option is quite interesting. Again, I'll just offset that slightly so we can see. Um, and what the what the wipe allows us to do is it allows us to just check through on a side by side basis. And of course, we can. If I just come to that part there where one's turned to green and one hasn't, there, we can wipe across we can uh, we can rotate this this might seem arbitrary but there are some benefits for this we can even tra take take up and down the the opacity so it gives us another way of actually sort of com doing a comparison between the two anyway i'm going to actually take that i'm going to assume that this is correct in this case it's so easy i've just got to drop it drop it there like that and then i can uh, i can perform an identical sort of check to make sure that's okay and I know it's fine so I'm gonna delete out the the proxy now um, so that we uh, so and we can go back to our we can go back to our original workflow so what I want to do now is I just want to um, introduce the the uh, the nuke studio soft effects uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pick on my first hand shot which directorial I know needs to be flipped and I'm going to use a soft effect to do that now the soft effects are located how am I going to get at these within the screen capture I'll probably have to come up okay so the the soft effects are, are contained within this effects menu here you can see that we've got a whole bunch of a kind of a whole bunch of different sort of simple tools sort of a subset of the tools that exist within Nuke okay I'm going to choose transform in this particular case because I know that this clip needs to be uh, flipped um, and the easiest way to do this is to just is to just set it to minus one on the what on the on the width okay and that has now added this little interim uh, strip on the timeline which is a soft effect Okay, you can see that by double clicking on it, we can get back at those parameters and make changes to them. So this is something that is uh, non-destructive. It can be adjusted at any time. Uh, we can also keyframe these things, as you might expect. So, for example, let's say for for argument's sake that we want to uh, we want to do an optical an in, a post-production optical effect on this. We want to zoom in on it. So what we'll do with this is that we will apply another soft effect and another transform. And what we will do is that we'll come across maybe to around the, say around the five second point, and we will bring the, um, we'll bring the scale up somewhere like there. What we can do is that we can keyframe this, so we can come into set key, and we can come back to the very beginning, and then just bring our scale back down to its original. So what we've now got is a scale up over time. So they're just a couple of the uh, tricks that are available to us in using soft effects. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to select this soft effect, and copy it using Control C, and then I'm going to paste it onto the other two clips in my sequence that involve this hand flip. And you can see now that that has, uh, that's applied now to all three. Okay. 
Now we're about 20 minutes into this tutorial, so I think I'm going to break it at this point. Um, so I'm going to create a second part to this tutorial where we're actually going to look at how we can break out shots like this for visual effects and how we can actually create effectively a linking system. For those of you that have used After Effects um, and Premiere or After Effects and Photoshop, you'll know that you can dynamically link between the two. Well, what we'll look at is how we can actually create a similar relationship between Nuke Studio and Nuke Scripts. So we will t tackle that in the in the second part of this tutorial.